And Lord God, as we come to your word today, we pray the prayer of the psalmist in 119, verse 18. Open our spiritual eyes, grant that we may behold wondrous things from your word. And then Psalm 119, um, 27, 34, and a few other places, open our understanding. And then in James 1, 22, give us the grace to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 15, commencing with verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten, seventy palm trees. And they encamped there by the waters. You may be seated. Today I want to talk to you about biblical answers to healing questions. There are a number of questions that are frequently raised regarding healing, physical healing. And I should like to give some biblical answers to some of these questions. Now, one of our goals for this year is to read through the Bible, preferably in a different translation. If you have... Uh, not marked up your main translation that you use all the time, then use a different translation, and I gave you some recommendations as to some different translations that you may use. I, the main three will be the authorized version, AV, the old King James Version. That is the version that I most often use and will be using most often, and there are a number of reasons for that. And then next is the New King James Version, and then third, the New Living Translation. Those are the three translations that I will be using most often throughout the year. Now, there are others, but those are the main three. And uh, if you're going to read through in a different translation, then I would highly recommend that you choose uh, one, of those, one of those three. And uh, there are some instructions as to things for which you're to look and uh, some of the colors that you may use uh, as you discover certain things in whatever translation uh, you're using. Now, one of the reasons for reading through the Bible is that you have on file things that the Holy Spirit can bring to your remembrance. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, you know, when the Comforter has come, you know, he's going to teach you all things. He's going to bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. So one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to bring to our remembrance information that we have on file. 
if you don't have anything on file, <laughs> then the, the, the Holy Spirit can't bring to your remembrance something you haven't remembered, something you haven't put down, put on file. Your mind is like a tape recorder. Everything is there. But it's recall that we have problems with. And as we grow older, uh, you'll find that there will be a decline in your uh, recall. It becomes a little harder to recall things. And, and the way that you deal with that, you have to review more. I mean, there was a point where uh, last year I was uh, having trouble recalling some things and uh, my mind didn't seem to be as sharp as it used to be. And, and I looked for God in everything and I began to think, well, maybe God is telling me it's time for me to retire. And so I was considering uh, retiring because, because of my recall. But then the Holy Spirit reminded me is the reason that you're having trouble with recall is because you stop reviewing. <laughs> Uh, there was a time when I, and I've gotten back to it now, while, while I'm on the treadmill for about 30 minutes, uh, I do a lot of reviewing of uh, scriptures that I have uh, committed to memory. And so I've, I've gotten back to that, to that, uh, to that review. And so you, you, you have to review scriptures that you, you have committed to memory. It only takes a few seconds to review them, to recall them. In fact, I used to go through the whole Gospel of John. Every verse that I committed to memory in the Gospel of John, I try to get through all of those uh, while on the treadmill. And, and it's amazing how fast time will go when you're racing with it. You know, you're trying to get something done before a certain time. You'll be amazed at how fast time will go when you do that and, uh, or seem to go. go. But, but anyway, I've gotten back to, uh, to daily review and, and I see that my recall is actually what it should be and so on. But, uh, but that was the problem is I, I stopped reviewing. So it's important to review. But anyway, uh, that's one of the reasons for read, reading through the Bible is you have information on file. Another reason for reading through the Bible is you see things in context. Um, Jer Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, for example, a lot of people find comfort in that verse. You know, I, I know the plans that I have for you and, and so on. And, and that's, that's very good. If you find comfort in that verse, that's, that's good, you know. Uh, but for me, I don't find comfort in Jeremiah 29, 11 because I know the context in which it was spoken. Uh, God is speaking to his people. Uh, they are being in, in Babylon as a part of, uh, of discipline. God is disciplining them. And they're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. <laughs> and God's plan for them is after 70 years, he's going to bring them out of captivity. And so when you know, con you'll, you'll know context. That's a reason for reading through the Bible is you see things in context. Because a lot of times we, we take things out of context. And uh, when we do that, you can really get a, a, a misleading interpretation or a misunderstanding of something because... You, you, you're taking it out of the context in which it was, in which it was spoken. And when we read through the Bible, we will see things in, we'll see things in context. Another reason for reading through the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And uh, I'll try to show as I go. I want to try to show that to you. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Now, one of the questions we want to ask answer this morning is. Uh, uh, physical healing, is it in the atonement? Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, yes, he bore our sins and uh, we're, we're spiritually healed, uh, we find salvation and so on, but physical healing, is that also in the uh, atonement? Now, turn to uh, Isaiah. We're going to find, I'll give you the, the places where we're going to find the biblical answers to that question. Uh, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. We will find the answers there. And now, notice Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. I'll read them, uh, both of these verses first, and then I'll come back, and there's a word I want, to, a word I want you to circle. Surely he hath borne our, what is the word? Griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are, what is the word? Healed. Now, is that healing just spiritual or is it physical also? Look at the word griefs in uh, verse 4 of Isaiah 53. Circle the word griefs. And again, I'm going to get all this information uh, for you later. Griefs in Isaiah 53, 4 translates the Hebrew koli, C-H-O-L-E, koli. That is the, that is the he, Hebrew word. Now, and um, I encourage you to go to Bible Hub and you can do your own study. Um, the exhaustive, uh, Strong's exhaustive concordance, Koli is going to be 2483. That's going to be the number, 2483. And so you can go through the Strong's concordance looking at uh, the different words that's used by the authorized version to translate Koli. You can look at each one of those words and you can, by looking at the numbers, you can tell how many times a, uh, a, a particular word is, is translated, whatever. Now, this word occurs, koli occurs 24 times in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. And remember, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and Aramaic, the New Testament, Greek and some Aramaic. And so the main two languages in which the Bible is written, the main two languages in which the Bible is written are Hebrew and Greek. Those are the main two languages. And again, the Hebrew word here is koli. It occurs 24 times. That's how many times this word occurs in the Hebrew Bible. Now, the Old King James, and by the way, the Strong's Concordance is based upon the Old King James. And, um, and so the, the, the authorized version translates koli disease seven times. And in your notes, I'll give you the different places where, where it's translated disease. It's translated sickness 12 times. And so sickness is the word that is most often used by the authorized version to translate koli. And then it's translated sick one time. It's translated griefs, plural, and grief four times. And uh, I'll give those to you right away. Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. And then Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 7 and chapter 10, verse 19. So those are the four places that uh, koli uh, is translated griefs. Now, 24 occurrences of koli. Authorized version use, uh, translates koli, sickness 12 times, sick one time, and disease seven times. Now here... Why do the translators choose griefs rather than sickness or disease? Why do they do that? For Koli, in, in verse 4, look at it again, Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. Why didn't they say surely he has borne our diseases? Why didn't they say surely he has borne our sickness? And the reason that the translators chose griefs rather than disease or sickness is because of the belief and the bias of the translators. All translators, all theologians have a bias. I have a bias. And of course, the way that I deal with my bias is you have to pay close attention to the biblical context and the biblical context, uh, commentary, which is the Bible. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And you have to pay close attention to those. Now, let me say at the outset, all of the translations are reliable when it comes to the things that are most important to God. And the things that are most important to God are, number one, his glory. That's important to God, his glory. And they all get it right. Uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, and this will be in your notes, we were, we were chosen for God's glory. We were uh, uh, selected for God's glory. We were, we are commanded to give God glory. Um, uh, everything is for 
God's glory. We were created. There are a number of places. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, Isaiah uh, 43. Again, these will be in your notes. Where God created everyone and everything for his glory. Everything. Everything created for his glory. God chose before the foundation of the world before, for his glory. God calls, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, for his glory. God commands in a number of places to give him glory. One that we should all know is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So everything is for God's glory. All the translators get that right. All of them, even, even what I consider to be the worst. The next thing that's very important to God is our salvation. How to be saved and so on. And, and our sanctification, all of those things. So please understand now, the translations are reliable. They're, all re they're reliable when it comes to the things that are most important to God. But all translators, all theologians have a bias. And when, you, when, when a theologian or a translator uh, comes to a, uh, a Greek word or a Hebrew word that has uh, several meanings, and most of them do, the translator or the theologian is going to select the word that fits his or her bias. And here, and, and again, you can go to Bible hubs and you can look at parallel passages and you can detect the bias of a translator. And, and I urge you to do that. I do it all the time. The very first thing that I do in all of my preparation, all of my studies, I look at the Greek, I look at the Hebrew, and then I, I look at the different English words that can be used to translate a word. I look at the, the meaning, the Hebrew meaning. And of course, on Bible Hub, you have one lexicon. I have about 20 different lexicons. And so I can see the different meanings of a word I can see the different English words that can be used to translate that word. And then you can go to Bible Hub. I have some other devices where I can look at the different translations and I can see the different English words. I urge you to do this in your study. Go to Bible Hub and just, just go to parallel passages and just look at the different English words that can be used to translate a word. And, and again, a translator, theologian, they're going to choose the word that fits their bias. Those who believe, the translators that believe that healing is in the atonement, they translate koli by either sickness or disease. If they believe that, it's in the atonement. And I'll give you some, uh, some that believe that. Uh, the New American Standard Bible. The New American Standard Bible, you'll see, you'll see sickness. Uh, the Young's Literal Translation, you'll see sickness. The uh, complete Jewish uh, uh, Bible, and then the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible. Those translations will have either disease or sickness because they believe that divine healing physically is in the atonement. And that is why they choose those words. Now, those in most of the translators, if you look at Bible Hub, you'll see that most of them do not believe that divine healing is in the atonement, and therefore, the words that they use to translate koli are um, weakness, uh, the NIV uses pain, and, um, and so on. So you, you can do a study yourself and just see the different English words that are used, and you can detect, you can tell which the translators that believe that healing is in the uh, atonement, and those who believe that it is not. Now, again, best commentary on the Bible is what? All right, now let's go to Matthew chapter 8, where Matthew is actually interpreting Isaiah, and Matthew is interpreting Isaiah 53, 4, and 5. Matthew chapter 8, and uh, notice verse 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits. How did he do it? Underline that. How did Jesus cast out the spirits? Come on, come on. Wait. How did Jesus cast out the spirits? With his word. You don't have to go to a deliverance service to get rid of demons. What do you need to do to get, to get rid of demons? You know how to get rid of the demons? Saturate your mind with the word of Christ. 
Colossians 3.16, let, let, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Fill your mind with the word of God and the demons. The demons can't stay there. You see? Oh, <laughs> verse 16, let me read it again. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were. What is that word? He cast out the devils, and he healed how many that were sick? How many that were sick? All that were sick. Now notice the next verse. Verse 17 of, of, of Matthew chapter 8 that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah. Or I, well, Isaiah is what the word is. <laughs> uh, the prophet saying, read with me, himself took our infirmities and bare our, what did he bear? What did he bear? Now, what does the Bible say is the answer to the question? What does the Bible say? Now, what do the theologians say? What does the Bible say? And you want to learn. You want to learn what does the Bible say? And the Bible says what? What is the word? What is the word? Sickness. Peter. Later on, look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. 1 Peter 2, uh, 24. Now, now, if healing is in the atonement, He lives in the tomb. Why isn't that everybody doesn't get healed? Salvation is in the atonement. We have no problem with that, right? Salvation is in the atonement. Everybody, we all believe that. Okay, but now we're saying healing is also in the atonement. Okay, all right. If healing is in the atonement, why doesn't everybody get healed? You believe that salvation is in the atonement, right? Sometimes you answer a question with a question. And here's the question. If healing is in the atonement, just as salvation is in the atonement, why doesn't everybody get saved? Think? I want you to think this morning. Why isn't that everyone doesn't get saved? Does everyone get saved? No. But healing is in the atonement. Does everyone get healed? No. All right. But let me get, I, I, I'll give you let me, let me give you this. I'm going to give you the answer that you usually hear, and then I'm going to give you the biblical answer. First, I'll give you the answer that you usually hear. And here's the answer that you usually hear. You didn't have enough faith. It's a faith issue. If you, had only, if you only had more faith, you would have been healed. If you only had more faith, you go to healing service, and, uh, you know, people are getting healed, everything, but, but you, know, you didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith. Now, there are four passages on faith in relation to salvation and healing. And I want you to see what the Bible says about it. Four passages. I want you to get these. Four passages in relation to salvation and divine healing. Let's start with, let's start with uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and notice verse 8. But by grace are you saved through, faith is like a, it's through, it, the through is like a channel through some, with something moves. Okay, that's the channel. By grace are you saved through faith and, read with me, that not of yourselves. Stop right there. That not of yourselves. What is that pointing back to? What's the antecedent of that? What's the antecedent of that? Faith. In, fact, in other words, everything, really, everything, everything that happened before, it's, it's because of, uh, well, but by grace are you saved through faith, and that, and, and that points back to everything, even the grace, that, not of yourselves, it, everything, 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 it, 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 read with me, is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? What is everything, everything, the faith, the grace, everything, a gift of God, you see. And so in heaven, you know, someone says, How, what did you do to get here? Well, your neighbor, he didn't get here. You're here and your neighbor's not here. Why, why are you here and not your neighbor? Your neighbor treated people better than you did. 
Your neighbor was a better citizen than you. Your neighbor was a better worker than you. Your neighbor was a better, 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 better. Why are you here and not your neighbor? Oh, oh it, it, I had faith. Your neighbor didn't. Well, tell me this. Where did you get the faith? Where did you get the faith? I'm here because of grace. Where did you get the grace? What did you do to earn the grace? Listen, grace means God has given you something you don't deserve. And if you deserve it, if you earn it, then it's not grace. You have to call it something else. Grace means you did not earn it. You did not deserve it. You should not be here the way you live, the way you acted, the way you behave. But you are here because God gave you something that you didn't earn. God gave you something that you did not deserve. Praise God for his grace. Salvation is how? By grace. Now, here's another one. Oh, this is another one that people like to turn to. Turn to Mark chapter 11 and verse 22. This is, uh, has to be among the most misunderstood passages in the Bible. Mark chapter 11 and verse 22. That verse 22 is what I want, but... Let's get the context. Let's get the context of verse 22. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, if you look back at the, the preceding verses there, you'll see that uh, there was, Jesus went to a fig tree, nothing was on it, and he cursed the fig tree, and it withered. And so it's the next day now, and uh, the, the, the disciples are observing the fact that the tree uh, withered. Verse 20, again, of Mark chapter 11. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou curse is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, uh, underline, have faith in God. Underline that. I'm going to come back to it in a moment. Have faith in God. But verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that ye receive them and uh, ye shall have them. And I may not get to these two verses today. And when you stand praying, do what? Forgive. If you have aught against any, that your father also who's in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Read with me verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. And this is a relationship type of forgiving. This, doesn't, it, this is not salvific. In other words, you know, you guys are going to say that before I can save you, you have to first forgive. No, uh, you need to get saved before you can forgive some people, okay? And so we'll, we'll, we'll get to this. We'll get to this. If not today, the Lord willing, we'll get to it later. But what I want you to see here is in verse 22 of Mark chapter 11, Jesus answered, said unto them, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Now, literally, that is have faith of God. Uh, God is theos, T-H-E-O-S. Of God is theou, theou, T-H-E-O-U. So, of God, those two words, of God, is just one word in Greek, and that is theou. Now, in God, in God is ace theos. What's here is ehete pistin theou. So, in God would be ace theos. Of God is just simply theou. And that is T-H-E-O-U. And so, literally, this verse is, have faith of God. 
Not have faith in God. And there's a difference. It's have faith of God. And, and most of the translators, this is what they have. Have faith in, in, in God. And um, there are a few. If you look at Bible Hub, uh, you'll see that there are a few that have, uh, uh, have faith of God or have the, the, the faith that God provides. And so this is what I want you to get here. The faith that moves mountains is a faith that God gives you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a faith that God puts in you. It's God's faith. It's God's kind of faith. And what Jesus is saying here is have God's kind of faith. Have the faith that God gives you. And when God puts that faith in you, that faith will move mountains. That is the faith that moves mountains. It's not a faith that you come up with. It's a faith that God puts in you. And like, uh, you know, we call for the elders of the church. Is any sick among you call for the elders of the church? Well, I'm, I, I shouldn't quote. Go there. Go there. James chapter 5. And so please just remember here. Literally, this is have faith of God. And if you go to the interlinear on the uh, Bible hub, what you'll see is a cheti, a cheti pistin theu is what you will see. And literally, that is have faith of God, not have faith in God, but have faith of God, which is a possessive. It's, it's, it's the faith that God gives you. Turn to James chapter five. Here's another one. James chapter five. James chapter five, beginning with verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them, the elders, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Please notice this is the prayer of the elders, not the person that's sick. And so if they don't get healed, it's not because they didn't have enough faith. It's because the elders didn't have the right kind of faith. So don't blame the person. Oh, you didn't have enough. No, 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 no. Read the verse carefully. And, of course, the oil and all of that, these are means that God uses to, to stimulate uh, faith and so on. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And who's going to raise him up? Is it going to be the, is it going to be the faith that's going to raise him up? Or who's going to really raise the person up here? Who's going to raise the person up? The Lord. It's the Lord who raised them up. And the, listen, and the prayer of faith is the faith that God puts into one of the elders. All right. And, uh, and notice, we'll get back to this later. If he has committed sin, they will be forgiven. We'll deal with the issue of sin perhaps today. If not, next, next time. And so then, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And that is, and, and save means deliver. And, and of course, again, the faith is a faith that God puts into one of the, uh, one of the elders. All right. Now, and, and we won't turn there, but in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, there were 10 lepers. There were 10 lepers. And uh, they said, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon us. And Jesus said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And of course, and, and this had never happened uh, in Israel history, is that where someone was healed of leprosy and they were to go to the priests and uh, uh, receive, uh, you know, be examined by the priests and so on. And, and uh, receive a certificate of healing and, and so on. And so uh, Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, when you notice I'm here, healing isn't always instant. Healing is not always instant. If you read the account, you'll see that, uh, you know, I mean, they could have said, you know, hey, hey, I'm not healed. But what they did is they just start walking by faith. Jesus said, go show yourself. And the Bible said is that they were healed as they went. The healing wasn't instant. 
It was as they did what Jesus said do. Oh, obedience is so important. Obedience is so important in relation to healing. Obedience is so important. And so as they did what Jesus said do, they were healed as they, as they went. So healing isn't always instant. Instant. And sometimes, sometimes God uses means to heal. This is important. Uh, turn again to our first, the first passage that we read. Go back to Exodus. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot about divine healing in Exodus chapter 15. Go back to Exodus chapter 15. And please read and reread Exodus chapter 15 uh, because the Lord willing, I will be coming back to it on, uh, on next Sunday. Now here, and I want to, what I want us to see here is that sometimes God uses means to heal. You know, there's a question. Okay, if you go to the doctor, are you, are you exercising faith in God? If you take medication, uh, you know, if, you're going, if you believe that God is, he can heal and all of this, then why are you taking medication? Why do you go to the doctor? Sometimes God uses means to heal. I mean, I was criticized for going to the doctor with my uh, pancreatic cancer. And uh, thank God I know the Bible. <laughs> You know, it, it, people, you know, if you, you really believe that, that God can heal, I mean, why, why do you go to the doctor? Well, I want you to notice something I find very interesting. Is that here, uh, the people, they, uh, they've crossed the Red Sea, and they've, uh, they've spent three days now without water, and they come to this place uh, called Mara. And it's called Mara. Mara means bitter, not Mora. Now, we have a member that's called Mora, and Mora is not the same as Mara. All right, so please don't, don't confuse those and don't think Mora is bitter. It's no, it's, it's M-A-R-A-H. That's the one I'm talking about here, all right? And, uh, and so they came to this place where the waters were bitter and the place was called Mar, Mara, M-A-R-A-H. And, uh, and, and, and in verse 25, the people, they, you know, they're upset because they've gone without water and uh, they're talking about stoning Moses. And uh, Moses did what he always did when he had a problem is that uh, he prayed. And, uh, and please notice, like I said, there's just so much information here, is that it was God's will to heal the bitter waters. It was God's will to do that. It was God's will to heal the water. God did not heal the waters until after Moses prayed, although it was his, his will. And so you're going to remember that, you know, you know, God ordains ends, but he also ordains means to those ends, and prayer is a means to many of the ends God has ordained. And, you know, there are a lot of things that God has for us, but uh, it's God's will to give them to us. But he's not going to do it until you pray. He ordains the end. He ordains the means. It was God's will to heal the bitter waters. But God did not heal the bitter waters until after Moses prayed. And when Moses prayed, God showed Moses what to do to make the bitter water sweet. Now, this is what I, please read and reread this 15th chapter of Exodus. Verse 25 again of Exodus chapter 15. And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, this is a very important verse. We're going to come back to this because this one explains why a lot of people don't get healed and why a lot of people lose their healing after they, they receive it. It's in verse 26. And, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, Please, please underline this. I will put none of these diseases up on thee, which I have brought up on the Egyptians. Who made the Egyptians sick? Who did it? Who did? All right. Now, next time you hear somebody say it's not God's will for anybody to be sick, God made some folks sick. And you're going to say it's not God's will for anybody to ever be sick. First Corinthians chapter 11. Many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. First, Second Samuel uh, uh, chapter uh, 15, uh, 
as, as a punishment, a discipline to uh, David and Bathsheba, the Bible says God made the child sick. Man, know your Bible. Read your Bible. Oh, it's not God's will for anybody to ever be sick. It's God's will for everybody to be well. Yeah, if you obey him. <laughs> but I'll read this. We're going to come back to this. We'll come back to it. But here's what. Notice this last, the last clause here. Which I have brought upon the Egyptian. But I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And I'm the Lord that healeth thee is uh, Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha. Now, some will say Rapha. Actually, the Hebrew is Rapha. And so here's what I find interesting. In the context where God says, I'm your doctor, I'm your healer, I'm Jehovah Rapha, God used means. You wouldn't expect that. You would expect him to heal the waters directly. God did not heal the waters directly. God used means to heal the waters. He used a tree. He told Moses to put a tree. And, and again, uh, this is debatable, but I just happen to believe that that tree was pointing to the cross. Because the cross made a lot of bitter water sweet. And I just believe that. Now, it's debatable. But, but I mean, why a tree? Why, why, why didn't he, why, he, I mean, Moses could have taken a rock and put it in the waters and made it sweet. He could have put it through some dust in the water and made it sweet. Why a tree? I just believe it points to Calvary. Again, that's my belief, okay? You believe what you want to believe. <laughs> but for what I believe, I, I, but anyway, God may use means to heal. And so when you go to a doctor, you're not showing a lack of faith. When you take medication, you're not showing a lack of faith. Many people are dead today because they decide, I'm not going to take this medication. I'm just going to believe God. Well, God may choose to use means to heal you. Examples. And whenever I make a statement, you want to look for example, or anybody for that matter. In fact, uh, the, the people at Berea, we're told that they were more noble than those at Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was seeing was true. They wanted to see if, if what, they checked on Paul. So I don't mind you checking on me. All right. In fact, I want you to. In fact, I even give you the verses to check. <laughs> Here, I'll give you some right now. <laughs> Number one, uh, God used a, a, a tree to heal the bitter waters at Mara. Exodus chapter 15, verse 25. God used a lump of figs to heal Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 7. God used the Jordan River to heal Naaman of his leprosy. 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 through 14. God used salt to heal the waters at Jericho. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 through 25. Jesus used some mud in the pool of Siloam to heal a man that was born blind. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And oh, turn with me to, uh, turn with me to the Psalm 107. God may just use his word to heal. Turn to one, Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Psalm 107, and notice verses 17 through 20. Fools, because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. They're sick. Why are they sick? Why are they, why are they afflicted? Why are they, why are they sick? Why are they afflicted? Why are they afflicted? Because of what? Their, their what? Their iniquities and because of their transgressions. In other words, one word would be what? Because of their sins. Because of their sins, they are afflicted. Verse 18 of Psalm 107. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. Now, in the Bible, what are some things that are called meat? Well, in John chapter 4, Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So doing the will of God is like, is like meat. 
And uh, 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 the, the, the word of God is like meat. Uh, Job uh, 23, 12. I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And so they abhor all manner of meat. In other words, the, the will of God, the word of God. I, they, I mean, they hate it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Psalm 107, verse 18. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. They draw near into the gates of death. Verse 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Read verse 20 with me. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their distress. What did God send? Was it the theologian? Was it the philosopher? What did God send? He sent his word. And what did his word do? It healed them. It healed them. You see. And when we, well, let me, one more, one more. Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And Proverbs comes after Psalm. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Uh, verse 20. My son, attend unto my what? Words, incline thine ear to my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them. Read with me. And health to all their flesh. Health to how much of their flesh? All their flesh. All their flesh. All their flesh. Now, there's so much that I wanted to cover today that I'm not going to get to, but I need to do this is just one other, is uh, why is it that some people lose their healing? Why is it that some don't get healed? Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. And, and we'll just stop at this one here. Exodus chapter 33. And again, I'll come back and explain. I'll explain a lot of things as we go. Exodus 33 and verse 19 and Paul uh, quotes this passage in Romans, Exodus thirty-three nineteen, And he said, I will make all of my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now, I said I wanted to give you, why is it that some people don't get healed, or why is it that, you know, some people may lose their healing? And I gave you the answer that you usually hear, and that is a faith issue. This is the biblical answer to the question. Why is it that some people don't get healed? Why is it that same reason? Why is it that some people don't get saved? Look at verse 19 again of Exodus 33. And he said, I will make all of my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be, what? Gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will, what? Show mercy on whom I will show, show mercy. And so God is sovereign in salvation. God is sovereign in healing. God is sovereign in healing. Sovereignty of God in healing means God heals whom he wills. He heals them when he wills. He heals them how he wills, which may be medication. God heals whom he wills, when he wills, how he wills. And in John chapter 5, I've heard it said, oh, if Jesus were here today, he'd come and he would empty the hospitals. The closest thing to a hospital is in John chapter 5. There was a pool of Bethesda and uh, sick people were there uh, waiting for the waters to move and so on. And, and anyway, Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda. Read it for yourself. John chapter 5. He healed one man. One man. And that man wasn't even looking for him. He, in fact, Jesus said to him, do you want to be made whole? The man's been there 38 years. And man, 38 years, Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? Because once you're whole, you're going to have to get a job. <laughs> There's a whole lot of things that, that's going to change. If you, so you, do you really want to be made whole? And Jesus healed that one man and walked out. Why did he just heal one man? God is sovereign in, in, in healing. He heals whom he wills. 
He heals them when he wills and he heals them how he wills. He may choose surgery or medication to heal you. You don't, your faith doesn't tell God how to operate. Your faith does not dictate to God. In fact, the, the faith that you have, God gave it to you. And if, if you can tell God what to do and he'll do what you want him to do, then you're sovereign, not God. And so the faith that you have is a faith that God gave you, you see. And that is the faith that God's God to do what he does, but, it's, but he's, he's the one who put the faith in you. Oh, there's much more to say. God's word is rich. I hope you learned something today. <laughs> but oh, there's, there's much more to come. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the richness of your word. And I do pray that some of our questions have been answered regarding divine healing. And uh, next time we'll talk more about uh, the requirements to receive divine healing and to keep it. And so we just thank you. And we pray now for anyone who does not know you in a personal way uh, that you would today draw someone to yourself. And Lord, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just quietly pray these words to him, Lord Jesus. I acknowledge that I'm lost and that you're the only one who can save me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again bodily from the dead. Today I want to receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. Give me the grace to repent. Give me the grace to believe. Give me the grace to receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. And I pray and ask these things in your name. Amen.